Hello and welcome to California Relief's training on uh, importing uh, a collection of tree data into our tree inventory. Um, so this training uh, will go over the basics of if you have uh, a spreadsheet or other data set with information on trees that you've collected over time um, and you'd like to bring that into the network tree inventory program um, using tree plotter, we can bring that data in for you um, and we'll go over uh, briefly the process for how to do that. <clears throat> so what does this process look like? Um, when you are importing data into tree plotter, first of all, it's going to be facilitated by California Relief. This is not something that you're going to do by yourself. So as you're going through this process, just keep in mind, you know, we're going to kind of be working with you throughout. You can reach out to us anytime if you have questions um, and we're here to assist. <clears throat> that said, it is going to require some thought and care. This is not a um, quick and easy process that can be done in five minutes. It does take some preparation and some thought ahead of time as far as how you're going to approach it. Um, you're also going to want to have a pretty good understanding of the way tree plotter works before you start this process. So if you don't feel really solid on your understanding of the way uh, tree plotter works, I would recommend watching some of our other training videos and then maybe practice manually adding some of your trees into the inventory um, just to get a feel for the way the data is structured in there. So that's really going to help you in terms of transforming your data into a form that um, is compatible with uh, our data standards. <clears throat> So before you get started, you're going to want to ask yourself uh, a few questions. First of all, what are the goals that you have in mind? Um, you know, if you have thousands and thousands of trees from decades going back, um, you could bring all of that data into tree plotter, but think about, you know, the amount of effort required to do that and is it worth it? So if you really only plan to return to some of those trees that you've planted in the last few years, you might want to start just doing, you know, one bite-sized chunk at a time. Um, and that way you can restrict your efforts to data that you're actually going to use. The other thing is, you know, if you have a ton and a ton of different, you know, information recorded about each tree, you, you could import all of that, or you could just import selective pieces of information that you plan to use going forward. Um, the other thing is, if, on the other hand, you have kind of a smaller data set, you might want to consider just manually entering the data in. If it's only a few dozen trees or something, that might end up being quicker and easier. Um, if you just go back to where the tree is located, tree plotter is really pretty easy to use in the field. And you can just kind of type all of that in um, by visiting the tree or at your desk, you know, from your spreadsheet. Those are both options. Um, but just to briefly talk about what this process looks like. Um, you have your data, you're going to want it to be in the right format, and we'll talk about all that. You're going to transform your data so that it matches the conventions that uh, tree plotter uses so that the uploader is compatible. And then you will send that data off to me so that I can import the actual trees into the software. All right, so let's dive into the actual process here. Um, so the first steps to uh, adding your uh, tree inventory into tree plotter um, <clears throat> are to think about, are you gonna be using this data in the future going forward in its current form? So if you have a spreadsheet, um, think about whether you're gonna be going back to that spreadsheet after you've completed the import and continue to work with it, or is it you know kind of that's where the data is now you're going to move it into tree plotter and then you're done with it. If you do plan to go back to the old data set ever for any reason, or if you think there's even a chance that you might do that, there, there are a couple modifications to your data that you might want to do before you start this process. Um, you may want to mark which trees have been imported and which have not. And this is important, especially if you're going to be uh, moving some trees in and others not or doing it in chunks. That way you can avoid accidentally importing the same tree twice, which can cause a lot of confusion. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is you're going to want to have some sort of tree ID number so that you can connect each individual tree in your original data set to the tree as it appears on the map. Um, you're also going to want to create a working copy of your data. So I recommend saving the original data set. You know, don't change too much there, although you may want to make the above changes. 
But once you finish that, you're going to want to save a copy so that when you start tinkering with the data, you can always revert to the original copy if you make a mistake. Um, you also need to make sure that your data is in the proper format. There are two different formats you can choose from. Uh, you can use a CSV file, which is basically a more simplified version of a, an Excel sheet. So it's a spreadsheet with you know, cells and data. Or you can use what's called a shape file. Shape files are going to be um, a type of file that uh, GIS software often works with. This one's going to be a lot more complicated, so we're not going to talk about it during this training. But if you do already have your data in that format, it could be worth considering. Um, and then finally, uh, we can uh, talk about um, removing already imported trees. So if you had already done this process in the past and you did have you know, that column that shows was this tree added to tree plotter previously, yes or no, you're going to want to remove all those trees that you already imported to avoid accidentally duplicating them. So next, with those first steps in mind, let's actually take a look at how this would work in practice. All right, let's imagine that this is a very small tree inventory that I would like to import into Tree Plotter. I've got it here in an Excel spreadsheet, all the information that I want to bring in, and um, we'll go through the, the steps to get started. So first of all, I'm going to want to ask myself, am I going to continue to maintain this inventory in the spreadsheet that I have here, or am I just kind of moving over to Tree Plotter and then this data is going to be abandoned, at least in this format? Um, in general, if there's any chance that you're going to want to work with this spreadsheet ever again in the future, I highly recommend adding a couple of columns to your sheet if you don't have them. The first one is going to be in TP or in Tree Plotter, and basically this is going to represent whether each tree has been brought into Tree Plotter already or not. This is going to be extremely helpful if you ever end up importing part of your inventory but not the whole thing, um, or if you end up adding more trees to this inventory later. Um, after you've already imported um, the ones in, from before. Um, so I'm just going to put no for most of these, um, but let's assume that uh, I actually have already added this tree at the bottom here. Um, maybe I was playing around, I just went and manually entered this tree. Um, so we'll put yes for that one. Um, the next field that I might want to add, and again, same situation, I'd highly recommend if you plan to work with this data in this format in the future is um, a unique identifying number. Um, so we can call this um, XID for reasons that will become clear later. And basically we just need a unique sequence of characters that represents each tree. It can be as simple as one, two, you know, one, two, three, four, or it could be more complicated if you prefer. It's completely up to you. So I'll just go ahead and number each tree uniquely. Um, Next, we are going to want to um, save our uh, original data file here, so I'll go ahead and do that. And then um, now I'm going to want to convert this data into a format that Tree Plotter can accept, which in this case is going to be a CSV file. So I'm going to go ahead and um, go uh, save this, but I'm going to save as a CSV, um, which I want to do. Uh, here. So I'm going to click on this. There's a few different CSVs in here you can see that are different. You want to click on CSV UTF-8, which is the format that works best for importing into tree plotter. So I'm going to go ahead and save that one. And uh, it's going to overwrite a previous version, which is fine in this case. So now I've got it in CSV format. And then the last thing I want to do here before uh, I start working on transforming the data is I want to find those trees that um, I already added to Tree Plotter. If I were to import all this data right now, it's going to create another copy of this tree on top of the one that already exists. So instead of that, I'm going to go ahead and delete this one from my working copy. I'll still have the original data in my original um, file, but in this file, I don't want to import that tree, so I'm going to go ahead and delete it now. Next, let's talk about some limitations that the tree plotter uploader has. Um, so even though we've already made sure that our file is in the right format, even within that format, there are certain limitations in terms of characters and other uh, things that uh, if, if we have those in our data, the uploader will simply fail. So we need to make sure that we're 
um, removing any of that stuff that's going to cause problems. <clears throat> so first of all, we can't upload more than 25,000 trees, um, where it says records, but that could be trees, it could be um, other related data. <clears throat> We're limited to 25,000, which in most cases I think should be fine. In fact, if you're considering importing 25,000, let's, let's have a, a longer conversation about that because that's going to be a big project. Um, we cannot have any blank rows or columns, so you'll need to remove those from your data if they exist. Uh, if there is missing data, so if there is you know, some uh, data that you collected on some trees but not others, um, make sure that that missing data is blank, meaning it doesn't say null, it doesn't say NA or anything else, it's just blank. <clears throat> and then next you're going to want to remove all special characters from your data. Uh, the uploader cannot handle those, and again, it will just not work if we have those in there, uh, with a few exceptions, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the file name cannot be more than 30 characters, so um, make sure to obey that. Uh, make sure it's relatively short and concise. And then uh, there's also restrictions on the column headers. So uh, in this case, uh, like date planted or user experience here, uh, those need to be shortened because they can't be more than 10 characters and they also can't have spaces in them. So in this little diagram here, I've highlighted some of the data that uh, would cause problems and needs to be transformed uh, before we can upload it. So with that in mind, let's just go ahead and um, talk about how that can be done in practice. So even though we have our data in the proper file format now, um, the uploader in TreePlotter is fairly limited and it has a lot of rules that we need to follow in order for the upload process to work at all. So let's go through our data and make sure that we are following those rules effectively. Um, so the first thing I'm going to want to do is go through and make sure that I don't have any blank rows. You know, so for example, if I just had a gap uh, right in here, I would want to go ahead and delete that. Um, or empty columns. So in this case, um, it doesn't look like I have any empty columns, but what's this? So this number of leaves field here, all the data is null. So um, sometimes people would record that just by leaving it blank. Other data systems, sometimes they'll put null or NA or something like that in empty cells. Um, either way, that's an empty column. We want to get rid of that. And also when uh, tree plotter is importing data we actually want those cells that don't have data so like this blank dbh field instead of saying null we want to make sure that that is completely blank so i'm going to go ahead and delete that null as well um, okay so next what we need to do is we want to go through our data and find all of the special characters that tree plotter cannot successfully import so there are a few characters that it actually can work with. So a slash, like as part of a date, that's totally fine. Um, a period, especially in a number like this 1.5, that's not a problem. Um, and then the minus sign or dash, those are acceptable as well. But beyond that, pretty much every other special character that's not like a letter or number or space, we're going to have to go through and remove all of those from our data. So um, you're going to want to kind of take a look at your data and just sort of compile a list of all the special characters that you'll need to remove. And then you can remove them using the find and replace tool. So if you press control F in Excel, it's going to bring up this little menu. I'm going to click on replace. And then what I want to do is type in the symbol that I'd like to find in the find what uh, box and then press find all. And you can see that it found that one cell that has the single quotes. And if you leave the replace with field blank and click replace all, Excel will just delete those. And that's perfect. That's exactly what we want. So now I'm going to repeat that with all of the other illegal characters that we can't import. So this pound sign will replace all those. And then uh, the double quotes, we can't bring that one in as well. So um, go ahead and delete those. Uh, okay, so I think that should be all of the special characters. Um, so next thing we want to think about is the file name is limited to 30 characters. So if you remember, I named my file practice tree data import. If you count those characters, that is just under 30, so we should be fine there. Um, and then finally, the column headers. This one is going to be the most restrictive. First of all, they cannot exceed 10 characters. Um, and secondly, they can't have any spaces. So 
Uh, for example, this date planted field, I'm just going to kind of shorten that, get rid of the space down to date plant. Um, you're going to need to use abbreviations here, um, but as long as you name them, you know, reasonably well, I should be able to understand what you're going for. Um, so I'll go ahead and shorten these that are that have spaces or that are too long. Um, and the rest of these should be fine. So that's that's why I named these two fields that I added the way I did to keep them nice and short and having no spaces. All right, let's move on to crosswalking. So if you're not familiar with this concept, crosswalking is basically a process of taking data that um, is in one convention and transforming it to uh, another similar convention. So, um, you know, one example would be if you have your data um, in centimeters, but the you need to have it in inches, you would transform it by um, uh, converting that unit. Um, but it can be much broader than that. It can also mean, you know, changing the word choice in your data so that it lines up with the word choice in another destination format. So this is something we're going to need to do here to make sure that it fits into the uh, tree plotter data schema. Um, so let's talk about the basic steps here. <clears throat> Fundamentally, what I'm saying is that for each column in your data, you're going to need to find a field that matches in tree plotter. Um, you're also going to want to label your headers clearly so that I, when I'm importing, can can tell where each column of data is supposed to go. That is, which field in tree plotter does it align with. So ideally, if you can't, um, you know, use the same name as what's in tree plotter, or in most cases, an abbreviated uh, version to account for the limited number of characters. Um, <clears throat> You're also going to need to make sure that each data type matches. So in tree plotter, each field has a specific data type. So um, a lot of fields, for example, are drop downs um, or radio buttons, which are those little circles that you can click on. And for those types of fields, the text in your data needs to exactly match one of the options in the drop down or radio field. So um, for example, uh, if you wanted to do status, you need to have your status in your data be exactly, you know, typed out the exact same way as one of the statuses in our status field. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is for dates, you're going to want them to be in a month slash day slash year format. Um, so make sure that that is uh, following that convention as well. That's, that's pretty standard, so it shouldn't be a major issue. So let's, uh, let's go through that process with our practice data set, shall we? All right, so let's start to walk through the crosswalking process with our data. Um, so as I said, for each of these columns that we'd like to bring in, we're going to need to find a field in tree plotter that can accommodate that information. So let's just start with the very first one, species. And if I go into tree plotter, um, well, there's two places you can find this information. You can find it in tree plotter. So if you click on a tree and then click on the details form, uh, you can open up this form, which has all of the fields under the different tabs that exist. Um, alternatively, we also have our tree uh, inventory users guide, which we're constantly expanding. Um, and that also has a list of all the various fields that are in tree plotter, as well as a description of how they're meant to be used. So this can be handy as well. So in this case, in my data, I have the species, but really what I have is the scientific name, right? Um, it's not a common name in this case. So if I were to look at my available fields, I would see that I have both the scientific name and the common name as species options. So I'm gonna make sure that this data is going to go into the scientific name field. So what that means is um, I'm going to need to go into tree plotter and see uh, if the options that are in my data, so all these different species here, if they line up correctly with the options that are available in tree plotter. Um, so what I can do then is click on this menu 
um, in scientific name. And for each of those species, I'm gonna have to search and make sure that it's actually in here. So let's start with the first one, which was Quercus lobata. And you can see that it is in fact in here. Um, and double check to make sure you spell everything correctly, both in your sheet and when you're putting it into tree plotter. Uh, otherwise you're gonna make a mistake. Uh, and so that means that for that species, I'm good to go. That's that's ready to import as is. I don't need to make any changes. So then I would repeat that for each unique species in my inventory. Now, I'm not going to go through that on video here because it would be time consuming, but I will point out there is one species that I put on the list here with um, deliberately with a different name than what we have in tree plotter. So if I went in here and I searched for Podocarpus gracilior, I'm going to find that that species does not exist in tree plotter. Um, now, you may not know whether that's because it just hasn't been added to our list or whether it's listed under a different name. Um, so as I have mentioned in previous trainings, what you can do is go to selecttree.calpoly.edu. And if you type in your tree here, Photocarpus gracilior, what it's going to do is it's going to search for that tree under all the names that it um, that it may exist under. And specifically, the name that we have in tree plotter is going to be the same as the name that comes up in select tree. So in this case, when I search for Podocarpus gracilior, it takes me to this African fern pine. I can confirm with the pictures that that's the right species that I want. And then it has the correct Latin name here, Afrocarpus falcatus. So what that means is if I go back here and type in Afrocarpus falcatus, that species is in here. So then I need to go back to my data and I need to find and replace all instances of Podocarpus gracilior and replace them with Afrocarpus falcatus. So I'm gonna make sure that I spelled everything correctly, right? looks correct. So I will go back to my spreadsheet and I will hit replace all. In this case, it's just one replacement, but if you had a longer data sheet, you might be making quite a few. Um, the other thing that is gonna happen here is that um, this Arbutus marina may not show up. Um, and you can see, as I was typing Arbutus, it actually did come up, but it's got the quotes around it. And unfortunately, because of the limitations in the uploader, that means that we can't uh, have this particular species match one to one with what's in tree plotter. That's okay. I can fix that manually when you pass the data off to me, but we do want to minimize the number of times that I have to do that because if I'm having to do that for every single tree species, if it's full of typos and long names and things, it's going to be very time consuming for me. So if it's just a one or two species that we can't get the formatting quite right, that's fine. Don't worry about that. So next we can move on to our next uh, column. We have date plant, which remember is date planted. And so if I go into tree plotter, I can find that field here. Date planted already exists and the date is in the same format. So we are good to go on that. Um, next we can look at status. So status is also a field in tree plotter. So if I go to tree plotter um, and look at the status field, I will find that we don't have alive as a status. What we have instead is this planted alive, which really is the same thing, right? Um, so what that means is instead of alive in my data, again, I need to replace all instances of alive with planted alive so that it matches up exactly the same. Okay, so just like we did before, I'm gonna press Control F to bring up the find and replace function. I'm going to go to replace. I'm going to type in alive because I want to find all instances of that word in my data. Although we do want to be careful with that, right? I don't have anything like this in my data, but if you did have the word alive appearing outside of this status field, be aware that it would replace every time that word appears. Um, so if you are worried about that, you can go into the options and you can put match entire cell contents. And what that'll do is it'll make sure that it only replaces cells that just say alive. So if you had the word alive in like a note or something, it would not replace that. Um, but what we can do is search for all, um, all instances of alive, uh, and then we're gonna replace those with planted alive so that matches the options available in 
um, tree plotter. And then I'm going to click on replace all and it made six replacements. That's perfect. So if I go to my data here, I can see that it replaced them. Um, so we would also want to go through that for address, for user experience. Those ones are, are totally fine. I don't need to make any changes there, so I'm not going to go through those. Um, the next one I want to talk about is stock type. So stock type is also a field that exists in tree plotter. So if we go to our tree plotter here, we can, we can find the stock type field. And you can see that actually um, what I have in my data right now is just a number 15, but what I'm the, what the correct option that's in tree plotter is going to be 15 dash gallon. So I need to replace that. Um, however, this is um, actually a little bit of a pitfall here that I didn't mention earlier, but when I re when I erased all of the pound symbols in my data, I reduced this field to just a number. And you know, you might not think that's significant, but keep in mind that this is actually not a number field. It's representing a type of stock, right? And so if we want to go ahead and find and replace all those 15s, right, and replace them with 15 dash gallon, um, that's going to create a problem for us because it's, again, it's going to go through all the data and anywhere we had the number 15, it's going to replace it with 15 gallon, which could be an issue. So um, there are a few ways to address this, but the easiest thing to do probably is just to go back and open up your original copy of your data that you created, right? Um, and we can open on that up in another window and we can go back and say, okay, I still have the original data. I'll just go ahead and copy copy all this from here and put it into my working copy so I can undo what I did before. Uh, and now instead of control F to do 15, I can do number 15 and I won't have the problem that I'm going to replace all the numbers throughout my whole data. So now if I click find all and then replace all, we're good to go. Um, all right. The next one that I wanted to talk about is DBH. So in tree plotter, DBH is called trunk diameter, same thing. Um, and so I can go in here and look at uh, the DBH field and I can see that with these little arrows here, it's a number field. So what that means is um, I can only import numbers into this field. So for example, if in my data I had written out, um, I'm gonna close this old file here. And if I had written out like one inch, for example, that would not import correctly. So if I did have that, I would need to remove those and just change it to um, only a number. The other thing to know about importing um, trunk diameters or DBH is that in our system, we always want to make sure that any DBH is associated with the height that that DBH was measured at. Um, so actually, if you go into the user's guide, um, that information is spelled out explicitly here. So if I go down to um, my trunk diameter here, it says you should always record the height at which this measurement was taken. Um, well, it turns out that information is not currently in my data. So um, if I had that information, I would go ahead and add it at this point. So what I would do is I would add, um, we could call it D height or diameter height, and then um, the standard DBH height that you normally measure at is 54 inches. So I would, I would want to look at the field in tree plotter and look at the units. So um, in, in this case, trunk diameter height inches, make sure I've got the right units. Because if, you, if you're recording things in feet or centimeters or some other things and it's expecting in inches, it's going to totally throw everything off. Um, so we're going to make sure that we have the diameter height recorded in inches in this case. And we're going to fill that in for all of our data, except not this, because that's blank. Um, another possibility, if you didn't, you know, if you're if you have this diameter data that you'd like to preserve and bring into tree plotter, but you know, maybe it wasn't measured very accurately, maybe you don't have the diameter height, we can still import that. Um, however, we're going to want to import it into a notes field instead, so that all of, because we want to make sure that all the data that goes into the diameter field is all collected to the same high level of standards so we can compare across all the different trees in the system. Um, so if you, do, if you do have data that's not quite up to that level, um, we can still bring it in, but if you put it in the notes field, you'll still be able to look at it. It just won't be mixed in with um, all the other data. 
Um, and then uh, our NTP field, this one we're actually not going to import, it's just for our own personal use. So in fact, we could even delete this from our working data if we wanted to. So I'll go ahead and do that now. Um, and then finally, we have this ID number that we had assigned to our trees. And if we go into tree plotter, we can see that we have the external ID field. And that's exactly what this ID is for. So that's why I named it XID in the first place to make it clear that that's where this data was going to go. Um, tree plotter also has its internal ID field, but um, that is automatically generated and can't be modified. So we have to have a, a different ID if we want to generate one in our spreadsheet for our own purposes. And that is pretty much the basics of crosswalking. Um, there are more sophisticated ways to do this in Excel that I didn't get into. You can look uh, up you know, data crosswalking methods online if you're interested in that. Um, especially if you have larger data sets, this can make things a little bit faster. But in general, this is going to be the most time consuming um, part of your data. So make sure to really think it through um, whether it's worth doing. Or the final step in uh, the import process here is making sure that our data has all of the fields that tree plotter requires when creating a tree. So if you remember from basic training or when you've used tree plotter in the past, whenever you create a tree in the system, there are a small number of fields that are always required for every single tree in order to um, successfully create it. So when we're importing trees, we're going to have to go through the same process. This is the basic data that we that we want to record for every single tree so that we know kind of the, the bare minimum about what's going on with it. Um, so what you'll want to do is go through each of these fields and um, double check to make sure that there's something uh, just like it in your data. Um, so the most important one, uh, or it's really two fields uh, on this list, which you might not think about is latitude and longitude. So normally when you're adding a tree in tree plotter, it either draws the location from uh, your location services on your device or wherever you click on the map. Um, when we're importing a whole bunch of trees at the same time, we don't have those options. So we need a way to tell the system where to place the trees on the map. And the way it does that is through latitude and longitude. Now, there are a lot of different ways to record latitude and longitude, um, but Tree Plotter is going to use the WGS84 coordinate system. So make sure that your uh, lat long data is in the correct format. And if it's not, you can look up online uh, how to convert it to the correct format. Um, this type of coordinates, it's, you know, it's the most common one that people use. Uh, usually in California, it's going to look like something, you know, 30 something comma minus 120 something, somewhere in that range or, or ballpark. Um, so make sure that all of your trees have coordinates. Otherwise, they're not going to be possible to import. Um, next, you're also going to need a status. So make sure to take a look at the status information in our user's guide to make sure that you record the correct status for your trees. Um, you also need to have some way to designate what type of tree it is. So either the scientific name or Latin name or the common name. Um, and again, those need to match um, the data conventions from our tree list exactly as much as possible. Um, we also want to record user expertise, which in most cases will be beginner unless you're exceptionally experienced or the person that collected the data was very experienced. Um, and then you're going to need to indicate for each tree whether it was planted or distributed by your organization or whether it was not. And then finally, there is the stock type field um, to record what size the tree was at planting. Um, whether it was a five gallon tree, a 15 gallon tree or something else. Now for some of these uh, options, if you don't have the exact information, so like stock type or even the type of tree that it is, um, there is an option to put unknown as the data. So don't get too worried if you didn't record this information. Um, we can still import it. You just need to create a column and put unknown for those trees that you don't have that information. All right, so let's return to our practice data here. And what we'll need to do is go through each of those required fields and make sure that it's present in our data. Because again, if any one of those is missing, we won't be able to complete the import process. 
Uh, now, as I mentioned, the most important of the required fields or the most, the two most important are the latitude and longitude fields. And that's because without this information, tree plotter isn't going to know where to put the tree on the map. Um, so without that, we really can't import the trees at all. Um, now, if you have latitude and longitude information, great, that makes things a lot easier. But what I've seen is a lot of groups may not have that specific level of uh, location information. Instead, they may have what I have here, which is just an address. Um, now, there's a couple of different ways that we could handle this. Um, the most obvious one is just to go back to this address or addresses and uh, record where the location of the tree is in with the exact lat long coordinates that I need. Um, this is going to be a lot more accurate, but it's also time consuming. Um, so especially if you have a larger data set, um, you'll have to decide whether you can spare the time to do that. Um, if you're not able to, there is a backup method, um, which is called geocoding. Geocoding is basically a method to translate uh, one form of geographic information into another. So in this case, we want to uh, translate this address that we have into GPS coordinates or latitude and longitude, right? Um, so there's a lot of different tools that you can use this. Um, a lot of uh, GIS software can do it. So if you have access to that, that's an easy way to do it. But there's also free ways to do this online, especially if you have uh, a smaller amount of data. So if you go into Google or your search engine or whatever, and you just search for free geocoder, you can see this GeoAppify website. This is one that I've used before. Um, and basically what you need to do is um, upload a uh, list of addresses and it will spit out the, um, the latitude and longitude that we need. Um, so what I'll do is uh, go to my spreadsheet here. And um, one thing that you might notice right away is I just have this, the number and the street. And especially for this street, H Street, that's a pretty common street name uh, across the world. So the geocoder is not going to know exactly where that is. So if you want to use a geocoder, you need to make sure that the address information that you have is very specific. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this into another sheet here. And I'm going to make sure that my address information is really specific. Um, so in this case, all of, I know for a fact that all of my addresses are in the same city and the same zip code. So I can just add that information fairly easily here. Um, if you have a longer list, this is going to be slightly more complicated, but you're still going to need to go through this process. Um, and so again, you know, some, in some cases you may wonder whether it's worth just going back and collecting the GPS coordinates. Um, or you can also uh, try to you know, place a pin on the map using Google Earth and get coordinates that way. That's another method. So there's a few ways to go about it. But in this case, since I have the city and zip code information, I'll just go ahead and enter those here. Um, and we can uh, have that there. Now, what I want to do is save this sheet as a CSV um, once again. And we'll say practice tree data import. Uh, addresses and we can save that it's going to ask me if I want to save the current sheet that's right that's what I want to do we'll just press OK and now that I have that uh, sheet of just my addresses I can go back to here go to this uh, GeoAppify website click on upload a file and I'll go to uh, that file I can remember where I saved it. All right, so here's my addresses. I'm going to open those up, and you can see that um, here's my data, right? It has the address, it has the city, it has the zip code, and I can just select these, make sure that it matches address is address, city is city, and zip is zip, right? Um, although in this case, it doesn't seem to know that. So we'll, we'll put postcode, right? Um, <clears throat> And we are going to geocode six addresses. That's great. We can even select the country if we wanted to. Hopefully it would recognize it, but just in case. And then we click on geocode. And now it's going to go through and do that for us. 
and we can click on download. And that's going to generate another CSV file based on the one that I had provided to them. And that will include a lot of extra information here. Um, and this is going to say, do I want to convert? I don't want to. And basically, here's what I need, right? Latitude and longitude. Um, and I want to make sure that my digits are all present as well. Um, it has a bunch of other stuff. It has a suburb. You know, we don't need any of this stuff. All we need is the lat long. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that. Make sure that um, your trees don't get rearranged during this process. Otherwise, they're not going to line up when you paste them in. But now that I've done that, I can go ahead and import my latitude and longitude. So a little bit of a complicated process, but um, hopefully that's not too tricky um, for people. And if you need help with that, happy to advise. <clears throat> so that's the latitude and longitude, which is really going to be by far the most complicated part. There is one more step here that uh, we need to think about though, because many of our trees, uh, they are at the same address as you can see. Um, and in addition, this latitude and longitude, this isn't really the real point where the tree is located. This is just um, a point usually kind of at the center of that parcel where the address is located, or it might be near the street or something. I don't really know, right? It just it's wherever the geocoder decided to put it. It's not the true location of the tree. Now, if it's a small lot, this might be relatively close, but if it's a park or a bigger property, it's really not going to be that close at all. Um, so I don't want to get confused later and think that this is actually where the tree is located. Otherwise, when I go to look for it, I might get really confused. And in addition, you can see that several of these trees have the same coordinates. So when I import them onto the map, they're all going to appear on the same point. It's going to be hard to see them all. So to make sure that that's clear when I'm looking at my data in tree plotter, we actually have a field in here um, that's specifically designed for this type of situation. So if I go into my tree details form under the location tab here, um, you can see that at the very top, there's this location accuracy field. And the options are either point or parcel. Point, in this case, means that the tree is located exactly where the point on the map is. Um, so those lat long coordinates are perfectly accurate or reasonably accurate to where the tree is located. If I had selected parcel, that would mean that the tree is located somewhere on this parcel, but the point that it appears on the map may not be its exact location. So this is going to be really handy in terms of avoiding future confusion for this type of situation. So in my spreadsheet, I'm going to add another column just to represent this so that when I import it, I can say all of these trees are going to be location accuracy is parcel. So I'm going to create a field again, remembering that uh, the field names can't have spaces and they need to be abbreviated. So I'll call it lock ACK for location accuracy, and then we're going to just put parcel uh, for all of those, and that way it'll be very clear what happened, right? Those trees are not exactly where the pin appears. All right, so that was a meaty one for sure with latitude and longitude. So let's go back to our list of fields here and uh, take a look at the next one, which is status. So status, great, we already have that in here. If you didn't, you would want to go through and add it back in. Make sure that you um, know, you know, make sure that you add information that you are certain of. It doesn't have to necessarily be current as of today, um, although it would be great if it was. Um, but at least make sure that that information was current as of when you last checked on the tree. So, for example, um, if the last time you saw the tree was it was in a pot and you gave it to a homeowner to go plant, you don't want to put planted alive because you don't really know if the tree was planted. In that case, you would choose the distributed to partner status. Um, so we're going to move on from status as ours is already set. We also need the scientific or common name. That's the field that I'm calling species here, um, which is uh, clearly enough the scientific name. So that's no problem. Um, you can also do it by common name, whatever your preference, but we need one of those. Um, we also need a user expertise field. So that's this user X field. If you um, don't have this in your data, you can just add a column 
um, that represents uh, the expert level of expertise. Probably you're just going to want to put beginner for everything unless there's some um, super, super experienced people involved or something like that. Um, we also need planted or distributed by our org. Um, so this is a field that if you haven't seen it in tree plotter, um, it basically represents whether your organization is taking credit for the trees in terms of reporting or whether they're just trees that you're tracking for other reasons. Um, and you know, most programs, this is going to be yes, meaning, you know, we planned, we helped with, we put the trees in the ground, we did whatever, we made sure that those trees happened, we were responsible for it, right? Um, but some types of programs, they may just want to collect information on other trees that you didn't plant or that you really weren't involved with at all. And that's okay, we'll just want to put, uh, make sure to label those as no, they were not planted by our org. Um, so in this case, we're going to assume that all of these trees, let's say we planted them. Um, and then the final required field is stock type, which lo and behold, that is in our data already. If you don't have this data, um, there is the option to put unknown, and that's fine, but we still need to have that column in our data so that it's not blank. Um, and so those are the required fields. Now that I've finished adding the ones that we're missing, we should be pretty much ready to do the import. And that's the basic process for transforming your data to get it ready for um, uploading into tree plotter. Um, so as we're closing out here, I just want to mention a few other things. Um, as you're looking through your data and looking through the data that you could be recording in tree plotter, it might be worth thinking about if there are any fields in tree plotter that seem useful to you and would be easy to add to your data right now. Um, so for example, if your trees are all planted in parks, you might as well add a column that describes the land use of uh, the location where the trees are planted and record it all as parks. Because if they're all the same, it's really, really easy to add right now. And who knows, you may end up finding that information useful later on, um, especially if you end up adding another program where maybe some of those trees are not in parks. And then you could compare did the trees in parks do better or worse than the trees in your other program. Um, so just think about things like that. And um, if it's easy, you might as well go ahead and do it. Uh, the other thing is, again, this is meant to be a collaborative process. I understand that this is fairly complicated. You're going to have questions you're going to need help from California Relief, and we are happy to help you. We want to help guide you through this process. So don't be afraid to reach out if it seems overwhelming and you don't even know where to start and just want to meet and kind of go over the basics again. That's totally fine. We can do that as well. So um, use us, lean on us as a resource, um, and we'll, we'll help you so that you can get your data in as needed. Um, that said, if you feel like you want to be a little bit more independent, um, the link on screen here at support.treeplotter.com um, has an FAQ on some of the basics from this training. So if you just want a quick refresher in text form, that's a good place to go, although it's not as in-depth as the training that we just did. Um, so it may be more helpful to watch this again if you feel a little confused. Uh, finally, I want to mention that this is a new process for us. As of the recording of this video, no one has gone through the complete uh, process, although I think there are a few groups that are getting close. So as I'm working with um, the various groups that are interested, if we determine a way to make it easier for everyone, we might tweak things a little bit. Um, so just keep in mind that this is uh, an evolving process and it's kind of a, a, our beta version of, of what, what I think this is going to look like. And hopefully over time we can make it easier. So if you do have any you know, questions or suggestions or anything like that, if you communicate those to me, that might help me um, understand you know, what's difficult for you as well. And then we can figure out maybe a better way. Um, all right, so uh, just as a brief overview, remember that all of uh, the previous trainings, including this one, will be posted on the uh, Network Tree Inventory uh, webpage on our, our website, californiarelief.org slash network dash tree dash inventory dash program. Uh, we also have a link to our user's guide, a resource library with some other um, important and useful 
uh, instructional documents. If there's upcoming trainings, we'll have the registration links there as well as links to sign up for my office hours. And then if you haven't signed up for this program at all, in which case, wow, you're really ahead of the curve watching this kind of advanced video, um, we also have program eligibility and application information there if uh, you still need to apply. Um, again, uh, the Planet Geo support page is uh, a really great source of information. As I mentioned, it's not as detailed as this video on this specific topic, but if there's topics that our training videos don't cover, you know, all every other thing that you might want to do using tree plotter, there's probably a page on it um, on the support page. So go ahead and search for anything that you might be curious about there. <clears throat> All right, and so that is the training on how to prepare your data for uploading into TreePlotter. Um, my contact information is here, so again, don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions, if you have feedback, if, if you have any problems whatsoever, um, I'm happy to help you. And again, feel free to sign up for my office hours or just reach out anytime that's convenient for you. And um, thanks for watching this training.